Hi, I'm Janet Gross. Welcome to Coping Today, a place where we talk about mental health and well-being. Today, we're focusing on a worldwide problem that has plagued us for longer than most people in the United States can even imagine, the horror of human trafficking. Dr. Roy Salgado from the University of Holy Cross is specialized in working with survivors of human trafficking, and, and that's all, uh, been a part of your practice for a long time. And, uh, you know, it's such a big thing. Why aren't we talking about it all the time? That is the number one question. Why aren't we talking about it all the time? Well, the nuts and bolts of it is that there's a demand, right? And so there's a supply. There's a supply of unfortunate human beings who are being trafficked. Why are they being trafficked? Because there are people that are interested in this as a commodity. And a lot of these are children. They're minors that are being trafficked, whether they, it's domestic are U.S. born children here or children from abroad? So who's seeking this out? That's the scary part. It's husbands, fathers, brothers, uncles, grandfathers, police officers, teachers, pastors, attorneys, physicians, counselors, coaches, politicians, actors, athletes, people high in the socioeconomic strata, people low in the socioeconomic strata, and everywhere in between. That's why we don't talk about it, because it's people that we know. It's not some one-eyed monster out there who is seeking to get this type of service. It is the person next door, someone yeah. in your own family, perhaps. Yeah. So you may be talking to someone about this commiserating or, you know, just saying how horrible it is, and that could be right. somebody who's yes. watching it or encouraging it or buying it or... Right. participating in some way human trafficking. Yes. Because had, it's not just the person who kidnaps, right? It's right. The, the, per, the, the people buyer. wouldn't be kidnapping. They would not be kidnapping children and then trafficking them from one state to another or one country to another if there wasn't a market for it. Yeah. There's a market for it. I've had a couple of instances where I've been working with people who have indirectly been impacted by it because their father has been arrested for looking at child pornography. The FBI just comes in and knocks on the door and they're in for counseling because their father was the one, you know, they're adults, you know, so I have an adult woman who's my client and says, I, I'm trying to str struggle with this. I'm struggling with this because I have young children, the age of the children oh. that my father that raised me was looking at this. Or college roommates. I've had situations where you have college roommates that the FBI comes in and one of their buddies was arrested in front of the rest of the group because that's what they were looking at on online. There's a big, a big market for online child pornography and who is it it's the guy next door it's the person in your family so in, watching it is you're a part of the problem exactly you are actually the demand for the problem exactly wow exactly. that's that's so scary you know i was when we were talking about this earlier i was doing some research there's actually a a, a national human trafficking awareness day every year in, which i didn't know but right. it's january 11th every right. year right. that's there has to be a day for it, you know? That's, yeah. that's scary, okay. Um, so if traffickers control the, kind of the, the food that, of the demand, right? Mm -hmm. So they're get, these people are, the, the young children, they're local. They're not local, they're, we don't know where they come from. All of the above, you might have some individuals that are uh, local. And when you find the local situation, Unfortunately, oftentimes, it's people that they know that traffic them. I have counseled individuals that they were trafficked by their own parents. Mm. You know, so you might have a parent who struggles with addiction and they need money to feed their addiction and they don't have skills to be able to go and generate some kind of revenue, but they have a child that they can sell for sexual services and then that's how gen revenue is brought in. There are a number of instances like that that have taken place and over the course of my career I've worked with survivors who have been trafficked if you will or pimped out by their own parents. How difficult is that I, you know and I'm, it's a little personal here but how difficult is that to sit there and look at this child and know what has happened and listen and yeah. just not fall apart? Well I would say the grace of God for me personally gives me the professionalism and the skill set to not fall apart because that child can't afford for me to fall apart so I have to be strong when I am working with that individual and so I haven't I haven't fallen apart you know I put on a professional cap and uh, do what I need to do 
Now, when I watch something on television, then I feel the emotions. Or when I see my own children at play and I see how blessed and fortunate they are and how overprotective, which I am, but I, I say there's no such thing as being overprotective in many instances yeah. because of, unfortunately, what happens in our world. And so in that way, how, am I, how I am Im impacted by it is the way I protect the children for whom I'm responsible. So we, as a community, as a society, we really should be aware that this is happening and yes. aware that we may be able to help. Yes. Okay, we're going to um, take a break, but we are going to talk to some people who have helped and who have, you know, uh, made a difference in lives. Yes. Okay. Um, before we go, though, the University of Holy Cross offers tele... Yes, um, the University of Holy Cross and the Maronites of Holy Cross for the past four years now have been offering free telemental health services to members of our community. So any resident in the state of Louisiana who is struggling with addiction, with depression, with anxiety, with trauma, and even something as significant as surviving sexual trauma of some sort, we have over 80 counselors in training who are there to offer free services through telehealth mental services at the University of Holy Cross. Okay, and we'll have that number up th through the whole show. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll be back with some special guests who can help us better understand this terrible reality. Stay with us. Is it okay to call you mom? Of course you can. Welcome back. We want to continue talking about human trafficking and to help us understand the enormity of this, we've asked Dr. Rafael Salcido, who is a forensic clinical psychologist, and Beth Salcido, a survivor advocate, to join us. We know this is, you know, not some far away problem. It happens here. It affects sons and daughters that we may know. And um, I know that you have been involved in helping children, adolescents. Um, get through this or get past it? I don't know how, what, what is the definition, but um, also you're the director of the Louisiana Coalition uh, Against Human Trafficking as Correct. well. So there's, yes. you are involved in this is issue. Yes. 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 Tell us about your experience. Sure, the Louisiana Coalition Against Human Trafficking is the umbrella um, organization for uh, the Free Indeed Home, uh, which is the first therapeutic group home in Louisiana. We established it in 2015, and uh, uh, since then uh, we've had approximately 130 uh, girls go through. Again, it's a residential. Uh, it's it's a specialized group home for girls who are the victims of, uh, or the survivors, I guess is a better term, the survivors of human uh, uh, of adolescent sex trafficking. It's ages, uh, theoretically, from childhood, age five until 18, but the majority of girls uh, fell in the 13 to 16 range. We did have some younger ones, uh, but uh, not that many. And they had that been happening here? Where were they from? Oh, the majority of girls that we dealt with were actually from the greater New Orleans area. Mm -hmm. And um, the North Shore, South Shore, predominantly the South Shore. We had some girls who uh, were from Mississippi. Uh, we had some girls who were from Florida. And we had some girls who were from Texas, but the vast majority of them from were from right here in New Orleans, or Baton Rouge. Or Baton Rouge how, right. how did this happen to them? How not happen to them, but how right. did they, they this happen? Right. So the story that after all the girls, what we have learned is that um, it, they're just now coming out with statistics, and I don't really go with statistics, okay? But they now the literature says 70 to 90 percent of children that are being sex trafficked have been victimized as very young children. And I learned that in the house, is that um, these, ch these little girls were victimized by a family member or a friend of a family at a very young age, like below 10, and so they have been predisposed to being uh, victimized. And so they, you know, and they will always say, Miss Beth, uh, I did all that for my uncle, my grandpa, my brother, my friend, or uh, my brother's friend. Why is it so wrong to get money and to get all the things that I want? And so really that's what the pimp's mentality is. He knows that. And he, it's not by accident he calls himself daddy. And it's such a, uh, a shame. 
you know, because he becomes their daddy, but it's in a, conv uh, a confused, uh, disoriented uh, way in such that, you know, they don't know what love is. They've never had real, now their parents love them, but most of my girls' uh, dads were vacant or they were in jail or wanting to be there, but they couldn't be there. And then, you know, moms were struggling their best. And so um, these girls didn't know a real definition of love. And so what happens is, is they say, oh, this is love. Because, you know, with the, all back in the day, it was the love languages, right? You know, what is your love language? And the pimp uses, my love language is giving you things. It just so happens that you have to do something for me to get those things. And so they don't get money. He takes care of, like, the clothes and the hair and the nails and all the things that make him feel pretty. All the things their mama couldn't give them because they didn't have money. He takes care of that. And so they think it's love. So the very first thing my girls did when they came into the house is try to get away. Because they didn't know that we were rescuing them. We thought They thought that we were hurting them. They thought that he was their lover, their boyfriend and they would try to run away to him. And it, it takes a long process. It's like, you know, you never talk bad about somebody's mama. You never talk bad about somebody's pimp or trafficker. You let them come to the realization that, you know, this really wasn't love. This was manipulation. This was using me. And it takes a long process. But they will talk about it, and they do come to terms with it. And so it's a long, um, you know, you just there for them all the time. You know, we had a lot of counseling sessions and whatnot, but it's just living with them and building that relationship and being that person to listen to them when they were crying in the middle of the night or, you know, when they have they want to fight. We had a lot of fights, you know, because that's what they're used to. You know, there had, you, you know, some people look at this and go, well, they made a choice, but there is no choice right. under 18. I mean, when you're yeah. 10, Yep. Mm -hmm. That's not a choice. That's, all you know. That's a learned behavior or a forced behavior. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So you cannot and, and blame them. They loved, I mean, they loved whoever victimized them initially. So they thought, well, why is this guy so bad when this man really loved me and he did this to me? Mm -hmm. It's a, a contorted view of what love is. And I've always, back in the day, I've always wanted to do a big billboard with a little girl with bruises and it's love doesn't hurt. They don't know that love doesn't hurt. They don't know that. And if you can teach them love doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt emotionally, and it doesn't hurt physically, and socially, it doesn't hurt. How love. long of a process is that? That's, I mean, it's a residential facility that yes. you guys had, yes. right? So it's... It could easily take us uh, between six and eight weeks just to get them from uh, not running away. Mm. And part of what she's describing is um, uh, termed uh, trauma bonding, okay, where they really believe that the person who's victimizing them uh, loves them and makes them special and so they want to go back to that person even though that person uh, has been basically selling them like merchandise and that's a whole nother uh, angle to this uh, a pimp can make anywhere between a thousand dollars a night five thousand seven thousand dollars a week uh, with the same girl and unlike drugs which when you sell cocaine um, you, uh, you, you once you sell it it's gone these girls can be reused and reused. And so the trauma bonding oftentimes leads to um, uh, obviously significant uh, uh, personal trauma. And many of these girls had uh, what's known as PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, they also had uh, certain personality features of possible future personality disorders. Uh, they had uh, elements of borderline uh, uh, personality and um, uh, many of them had uh, very limited educational uh, uh, experience. Uh, most of them had no experience in the, in the workforce, obviously because they're young uh, and because they're, they're, they're traumatized. And initially their goal as part of the trauma bonding is to return to their pimp. Um, and that takes a while to break. And like Beth was saying, uh, they confuse the attention that the um, pimp gives them including material things, jewelry, you know, the, the nails, all of that which adolescent girls love, uh, they misperceive that as love. Mm -hmm. You know, as I hear you all talk, you know, and two terms come to mind, I think the general population thinks of sex work and prostitution mm -hmm. in terms of something that of age women perhaps do, and then 
of age men go and consume and purchase and that there is some sort of you know, equivalent transaction going on in that sex work. Mm -hmm. And as I hear you all talk about the girls that you all provided these services to in this home, they're between 13 and 16. Mm -hmm. How do these young girls who perhaps to the consumer, they, they are engaging in prostitution and sex work, but then the pimp, the trafficker, how much older is the, the trafficker than the young girls? I would imagine that they're not that much older, mm -hmm. or at least in perception, mm -hmm. to these young ladies. Right, so uh, my experience is um, I've seen traffickers being students in the same high school with them, um, all the way to uh, grandfather age, um, and it's just really when someone says, you are so beautiful. You know what, I know your mom and your family just they just don't appreciate you, and you know what? I do. I think you're intelligent. I think you could be a movie star. I know you could be a model. And who, what little girl doesn't want to buy that, right? And then as he, they buy it, then it becomes this contorted uh, relationship where it's, and he's very good and very manipulative. He makes it such that um, he, he, they get, he gives a lot at first, and then he starts taking back. And if you want more, you have to perform for me, you have to do this. And remember, back in the day, the thing that was precious to them, their virginity, was taken by somebody that loved them. And so they don't equate that, the, you know, the same way you and I would. They do not equate it like that. And so, yeah, the, the trafficker, but you know what I always say about the trafficker? Also, because uh, I am just one of these bleeding hearts, the trafficker also didn't plan on that life. When they were two, three, four, five, six, or seven, they didn't plan on that. But some, it's familial. There's a lot of sex trafficking that is familial on both sides. The pimps lots of times grow up with a grandpa or a dad that was a trafficker himself. Now, you know, and the, the pimps get really upset. They're like, I'm not a human trafficker. You know, I'm a pimp. There's two different words for that. It's two means two different things. It means the same thing. Um, but it's familial, but also, uh, in terms of the children. Um, there's a lot of familial uh, trafficking going on within families from great-grandparents to grandparents to parents to children. That's the, the way their family lived and that's how they got survival sex. They get paid for providing sex. Wow. Now let's talk about the, um, the home is not operating right now. Right. Because of? Funding. Funding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and that's an issue. Right. Uh, I'm sure that's an issue all over the place. Well, you know, I, I can say that when the phone home was open, I love being on the Catholic radio because um, the Catholics were the ones that sustained us the entire time. We got a little bit of Medicaid funding, and that really paid for like the staff. But the girls' needs, every need they ever had, and was provided by. Um, the Respect for Life office went out to all the churches and would tell them and they would bring weekly, we had tons of cars full of food and you know, it was so funny because when the girls wanted to get, you know, act out, they would call DCFS and say, we're not getting the food and immediately they'd come out to the house because they have to DCFS and they, you would open the cabinets and the food would fall out. <laughs> you know, good food, not old nasty food, good food. And so I love being able to, and I know some of your listeners and your, uh, your audience are, were a part of that and I have to say thank you so much because that made that kept us open and we were able to address the needs of all those children and we're, they're still not finished, they're out on the streets now. When we closed down, we had no alternative and they're like, Miss Beth, where do we go? You know, and we got them back in DCF custody, but you know, when I opened up the house, the way I found out about it is I watched it on TV one exit one time and I went, this can't be happening. But when I saw that as like, if Jesus was on earth, he would do something about it. And you know, that's what my like umph was, is like if he, and I am on earth, and I'm walking in shoes, I need to do something about it. And then that's when we found out about it and found out that it really was happening. Yeah, yeah my experience uh, was uh, a little bit different than that. I've uh, been consulting with the uh, uh, Department of Children and Family Services, and um, so I started recognizing uh, a cohort of girls you know, who had certain uh, features, like I said, elements of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, some personality disorder, learning disabilities. You know, and uh, I started putting uh, elements together 
and concluded that a lot of this had to do with coming from dysfunctional families and then being uh, primed to be picked by pimps because the pattern was often you have a, a dad in jail, the mother might be involved with drugs, so there's nobody home, right. so DCFS gets involved, Department of Children and Family Services gets involved, and while there, or you know, correlation does not imply causation by any means, but 70% uh, of girls who have been trafficked at one point or another were in the foster care system for the reasons that I outlined. Right. They're, they're, they're legitimate reasons. There was nobody home. Right. Dad was in jail, mom was on drugs, and they were basically left alone. And so what happens <coughs> is that once that child is picked up and put in DCF custody, um, the child might run away. But they're not going to run away alone. They're going to get somebody else to run away with them. So a child, let's say, would run away from our house alone, which they never did. They always had two. And then they would be picked up eventually by DCFS because they do their job. They, they go out there and law enforcement does find the girls and pick them up, then put them in another group home or another home, usually not the group home, um, and then they would find another girl because they don't like to run away by themselves, and then that, take that girl back to the trafficker, and now you have two. It's an exponential growth, not in Louisiana necessarily only, but across the entire country. Um, child protection is involved in rescuing children that are in distress within the family. That happens. Um, early on they take them out and it's a cycle it's the family dynamics it's child protection it's the streets and then it's this exponential growth if that makes any sense at all so you want to eventually reopen yes this is your goal to reopen yes. to get some girls in there and I guess it's also the goal to figure out how to stop that yes. cycle right. that right. to stop them yeah. from to opening their eyes yes mm -hmm. and to see that you're not asking them for any for anything. Yes. Well, you know, it's interesting you said that because there's a, a nonprofit called the Polaris Project, which, <coughs> excuse me, rated Louisiana or gave Louisiana an A in efforts to prevent uh, sex trafficking. They changed the laws to where the penalties are much higher. We're talking about 50 years, depending on the age of the child. We're talking about fines of $7,500,000. And uh, so there's been a lot of legislative effort. And I'm a member of the uh, Louisiana uh, Governor's Commission Against uh, Human Traffic on, on the advisory board. And uh, uh, I've been impressed with the legislative changes that primarily attorneys who are on the same board um, have been able to accomplish uh, at the legislature. Okay. Well, please keep us up to date up to date on you know reopening the home to getting and we're going to be checking in with you often thank you so much okay. thank, thank you, you thank so you much, much for joining us right. uh don't go away we'll be right back everybody in my house knows how to ride a bike except me people ask how your children learn how to ride a bike and you didn't i didn't teach them I just created an environment where they taught themselves, and all I had to do was be there. Human trafficking is something most of us don't even want to imagine, but the reality is that some people, some very young people, not only have to face it, they have to live it every day. And, you know, Roy, from our previous guests, we know that, you know, it happens, and it happens here, and they have stories they have stories and and i guess when by the time they talk to you they're in a different place because they right. can right. talk to a counselor or someone who right. is really trying to help them right by the time they come to me they've been identified by someone in their community typically a teacher uh, a school counselor um, perhaps a pediatrician mandated reporters that's why mandated reporting is such an important mm. thing with all of these professions um, mandated reporters in the state of louisiana like other states would be someone such as a person who develops film at a uh, pharmacy you know a photo developer a teacher a counselor a principal uh, a pastor if you know of these things then you're mandated by law to report it but in addition to that, we all need to report things and help save these children. And sometimes it's masked, or it looks like, we talk about child sexual abuse quite often. I think that's something that, unfortunately, we're aware of that is more common than we had thought a generation ago. Yes. But now we're kind of familiar with the fact that child sexual abuse within the home is very common. But another layer to that is child sexual trafficking. That's common 
as well, more than anyone would like to imagine. And that it's linked to uh, dysfunctional home environments, you know, a father not being present, uh, impoverished situations, people who have need for basic foodstuffs and supplies and resources, limited resources, and then that vulnerable child, as the Salcedos had stated earlier, is that now they are identified by a pimp, a trafficker, oftentimes an older child. This is something that they alluded to, too. A lot of this is happening within our schools. So you might have a 17, 18 year old guy who befriends a 13, 14 year old girl, convinces her that he likes her and he's her friend, and then if you would love, if you love me, you would do this. And then it's, it's more common than you would think. Yeah. And so the thing is being aware of it, being open to it. You might have some parents that are not necessarily aware that this is what's happening with their children, but children are doing this to one another. Now, there are other adults as well, you know, that are, are doing this to children, clearly, but it is very prevalent. And as I stated earlier before, why isn't this talked about? Because there are too many people that are involved in some way, including the casual, indirect viewer of pornography, of child pornography, that is also an active participant indirectly, if you will, in this. Because child sex trafficking, a big part of it is taking pictures with the dawn of the internet, with pornography, taking pictures and uploading it and making money off of that, that's a big way that they make money. So, th so there's a lot of people that are trafficked in that way, and then there's a lot of people that are trafficked in the sense that they are actually physically prostituted out and sexually abused. But everybody in that chain is responsible. Everyone, everyone. Everyone, from the person, who, you know, you said casually. There's nothing casual about that. That's an intentional yes. thing. Yes. Uh, so, anyway, um, so when you talk to them, will they, uh, you know, and you, obviously, you know, you wouldn't give names or anything, but do they, do they talk to you? Are they open about it? Do they, you know, do they see their situation? Some yes, some no. Um, there's some that they're ready to talk, that they've been through so much, and that they want to lay their burden down, and they're open. Um, by the time I see them and work with them, they're just so worn and, and, and broken down that they want to feel better. Others are resistant, others are hesitant, and they want to protect their pimp, their trafficker, mm -hmm. their abuser because of Stockholm Syndrome and really identifying with their yeah. perpetrator because they gave them food, they gave them resources, they gave them things, and so, so there's that psychological manipulation that had taken place mm -hmm. that's still ingrained. So all of the above. Wow. Okay, I, and you know we're going to be doing more shows about this, especially when there's help available and hope available. Yes. Okay. All right, great. Well. Thing. Oh, do you have any tips before we go? Yes, it's important that we all get involved. And when you think about this issue that we're all facing, that God's children are not for sale. And when we think about the child sex trafficking that's happening in our country and around the world, that we all stand up and fight this evil that's plaguing our society. Together. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Roy Salgado, and for all your help and for the help of all your colleagues at the University of Holy Cross and our guest today. And we thank you for watching and for being a part of Coping Today.